Well, here we are at the end of the semester at last. And only one thing remains, which is the exam. So today I'll be asking just general questions about the exam. The solutions to test six are out there. I hope you've seen them. At least you get some ideas of how these things should be written. So I don't think the analysis is going to be hard in this test, especially after I gave the code for the uh, data from you know, converting data from white to long format as well. I didn't want that to hold people up, so that should be easy to do. And the analysis should be fairly straightforward. There seems to be lots of confusion as to what the response variable is. I think that should be fairly obvious. Uh, but uh, when people ask me questions, I have answered as best as I can. I think and those are the kinds of things you should be able to pick up by yourself from this kind of course. What's the response variable? What should I do with the analysis? How do I analyze data? Because at the end of the whole course, that's the whole point. Given some data all of a sudden, how do you analyze it? Because you go out there as a scientist or statistician, you are the expert. People expect you'll give answers. Decide how to analyze the data. What do you do with it, right? You can't ask them what do I do with it. What's the response variable? Because that comes as part of the study itself. You decide how the thing will be conducted from beginning to end, just about. So, any questions? Graph says the thing is, all you need to do is look up things like, you know, generally speaking, um, medical visits and medical services and look at the key kinds of words, by health insurance, by Medicaid, or whatever else, those kinds of things, right? And you'll find something there. There's not a lot there, but you'll find a few that are relevant and put them in there. Yeah, people have found quite, that's, in fact, if you search, you'll find quite a few, but you don't want to focus on those that are relevant for the study or the paper that you're looking at, right? So you're looking at the aims of the analysis for the uh, types of visit we're going to make and the frequency of those visits essentially based on access to Medicaid and health insurance. And of course, you'll be adjusting for the other queries as well, like age and health and whatever else you've got there. So if you search for those kinds of things, you know, access to medical uh, care or uh, use of medical care, you'll find some things out there. Use the relevant ones in there, pick what you find. When you look at these kinds of things, you don't have to read the whole paper. What you require to do is, is scan it and see what the important bits are. So the abstracts, the bit you'll read, look through the methodology and some results section to see what they've got out there, and in the end, the discussion or conclusion, see what they've said there, right? You don't have to read everything. You read the whole thing, of course, if you're going to do more analysis or more research on the paper itself. But if you're doing, doing literature surveys or just looking at uh, uh, surveys of what's out there in the current uh, the, the work that's being done in the area you're looking at, You'd survey the thing by looking at those bits in particular. Now, you might go back and look at some more details afterwards, but that's okay. As you'll realize when you do the writing up, you might require more. But by and large, you can look at what they've done, what they've found. And anything particular with the data itself. If the data was, say, American data, you mentioned it's in America, or whatever else, you know, so and so did a study of this kind of thing in the US environment, or in Europe, in Australia. That's important, right? or something else about the data as well. I mean, the references should be okay because they will tell you the age or the date of the uh, reference as well, and that guides you as well. You don't want a lot of old ones. Some new ones will be good as well, but you have to balance the thing out, yeah? See what you can find. So in other words, I'm saying you don't want a lot of old ones. You do want the new ones as well, some new references as well. Don't just get everything pre-1970 or something like that because the environment changes, the whole thing changes. So you want some later ones as well to balance the picture out as well, yeah? Any more questions? Uh, so the structure, well, basically the structure, you, you require an abstract, right? Abstracts are usually the last, last thing you write. Introduction you can write early because once you've done your literature survey, you can write that out. Methodology is no problem at all. Analyze the stuff, give the results as well. The discussion and conclusion can, can be one separate. Uh, see, if you have a discussion and conclusion, then what the results does is just report the results. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't interpret the results in any way. Discussion can be around the, what you found. If you write a conclusion as well, it's going to be along the lines of the major findings. At least go back to the question of interest, what you found in the major findings, right? If you just write a discussion and conclusion in one, 
in your last paragraph can be what I've just said about just a conclusion. Major findings. Focus back on that. Yeah, what you can find. I said that in the last week or week before, right? That uh, this isn't, this still isn't the right model because you aren't actually taking care of correlations within the data itself, and correlations here within the observations itself, right? Sorry, uh, is is within the uh, response variable itself. So it's not exactly the right model, but it's better than uh, this is. If you can look at uh, the vi visits as uh, with respect to the type as well for each patient, this is what you can do. It's not the best. You learn, I hope, next semester, if you do my course, how to handle this kind of data with correlations in there. Yeah? It's not the exactly the right model. And that's something you can criticize. You can say it's not the best model. Something you can say, if you wish. Anything more? What do you mean different types of models? Yeah. So you don't eliminate the model, right? You do all three models or whatever else, and you decide which is the best one. And uh, you might compare the results between those things. Yeah, now, the thing is, is fairly clear, because if it's over-dispersed and there's dispersed, you're done, right? It's not the best model. Well, then you get neg negative bi binary and quasi-poisson. Uh, the things to look for there will be residual plots as well as the actual values of coefficients to see whether they make any sense. So if the model seems to fit okay, and the dispersion seems okay, but the, the coefficients are huge, well, that's not going to be interpretable, right? You don't have something like where you got counts up to about five or six, and the mean says it's about 200. Doesn't make any sense, yeah? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Is that the, the first thing is just to look at the model as just standard, right? Uh, but step AIC is a guide. It will still leave you with models where variables are insignificant. Sorry, uh, variables are exactly insignificant. And so from there, you'll reduce the model by hand. It's no other choice. But uh, you should also look through the step AIC to see what's done because Sometimes it takes the variables you really want in the model, so you can just go back and redo the thing by hand. It's a guide, and when large models, with large models, you've got no choice but to do it by something like that. Otherwise, it'll be there forever. So for smaller models, you'll try it by hand to start off with. Yeah, don't worry about the rest of it. But as I say, if you've got something like you know 50, 60, 70 variables in the model, and some interactions you're going to try, then step by is a good one to try. The other aspect, of course, is. If you've got missing data in the, in the uh, uh, data set that you're dealing with, then as I was saying earlier, as step AIC removes variables, then your data changes. Because if you remove a variable with, with the missing values, when it fits the next model, it's not going to include more records. So then it can't proceed. It'll just duck out saying can't do it. So in those situations, at least, you might concentrate on just the complete data to see what it looks like, and then apply your uh, procedure that you see with the step IRC to do it by hand, you'll see whether it still works the same way. You might find some differences. Anything else? No, no problem, because that's estimated as a parameter of the model. Yeah, but the negative binary tries to actually adjust for the dispersion over dispersion in the parts on right. Yeah. So that's, that's going to be okay. Your best guide will be just looking at the residual plots and then taking a look to see what's happening with coefficients itself. Any more? Well, in the end, of course, it's all in the writing, yeah? So uh, 
the, the, the marking schemes are there, you see what the, where the marks are, but it's how you write the stuff, write it carefully. Downright things they just aren't true. If you interpret coefficients, especially for categorical variables, make sure you interpret them correctly. So you're making sure you're making reference to the reference level and then correctly interpreting the coefficients in the scale that they're in. Otherwise, things don't make sense. And uh, as I said to somebody earlier, you just write what you see in the results. Don't try and, uh, it's like in ANOVA, right? You must have all done ANOVA by now, I hope. If you haven't seen, we look at ANOVA, you know that if you find that the uh, result is significant, you can try and work out how the differences are. You might find if you do the usual ANOVA, like doing some kind of post hoc test, that uh, you've got, say, five levels. One and two are the same, two and three are the same, but three is different from the rest, and four and five are the same. Now, you're going to say that one and two are the same, and two and three. You can't say anything about these first three, because one is the same as two, and two is the same as three, right? But one and three don't have to be the same, you know that. What you can say certainly is three is different. How is it different? Bigger or smaller. And four and five are the same. Just see what's clear, right? Don't try and confuse yourself or confuse others or make a story with other things as well. See what is clear and make those clear statements. So you've got, say, six or so uh, particular kinds of videos. You can say, first of all, that the non-hospital visits are the smallest in mean. Done, right? And these are the highest in mean. And somewhere in between lines the rest of them, if you wish to consider them further. But also look at things like, you know, in the data you've got males, females, and you've got race as well as gender, age, all the rest of it, family income. You might find that those with a high income go to the doctor more often. Well, that's not unusual, yeah. People who have earned more just can afford to go more often. Uh, more highly educated people go more often. If you've got better education, you've got better knowledge of health systems, and you've got a better uh, knowledge of your body and your health as well. You're more concerned with it. And so you'll go more often. Those kinds of things are probably about, uh, about expected. But if you suddenly find that people with high income don't go to the doctor's often, then you will say this is unusual, unexpected. Right, there's something to highlight. This is unexpected. Or you find that old people don't go to the doctor so often. Again, that's unexpected because the elderly, we expect, will have more health issues and they'll go more often. So those kinds of things you can pick up on. Things you find unusual will be the kinds of things you pick up in discussion, not in results. Results is just on results. Yeah? Anything else? Yeah, that's right. So if you're looking at something like, for example, age, and the coefficient is 0.1, but your age goes from 10 to 90, then that's going to be reasonable, right? Because by the time a multiply of 90 becomes 9. But if he's looking at something like uh, the effect of, uh, uh, say, race, yeah? You've got two or three race categories, and one of them is significant, but the coefficient is 0 0.01, or let's make it 0 0.001. The others are not significant. Well, that's not worth it. I'll have to take it out. Because if it, even if you take the exponential of that, it's going to be very close to one anyway. Right? So I'll drop those ones straight away. It's not worth keeping the model. Now, you might find, though, that if you drop it, the model gets totally crazy. Sometimes it happens. That case, you'll keep the thing in there, but it's not worth reporting. I wouldn't report it. Yeah? Nothing more? Anyone? My question is about the same thing as last time. But in your introduction, should we be looking for this like mainly about whether elsewhere has an effect or should it be looking at the same kind of thing? You probably will find all those things related as well because you see whenever you look at this kind of data you'll find that the effect of uh, well the type of visit is what was the primary thing we're looking at. Um, but you'll probably find as a good study, we'll have to adjust for the other factors as well, or the other variables. So yes, we'll find those there. If something doesn't, you know, quite often you find uh, in literature, and this is because it's badly done, you know, I look at a lot of education stuff, and they look at things like student performance, where they ignore the demographies of the students, you know, the, the uh, age, and for example, the sex, the high school marks, all those kinds of things they ignored. In that case, all they do is take a look at the performance of students in two different ways of teaching. Well, you can't tell. 
right? How they different? Because you have not adjusted for any of the covariates or any of the uh, uh, other variables that can be associated with performance. So, and all they do is they just do a single linear regression or a simple t-test. It's useless, in my opinion. So if you find those kind of things, you can say, these guys did this work and found this, but they did only this analysis, right? So when I do my work, I adjust for all these kinds of things. So when you're looking at things like performance and they're looking at attendance, for example, they look at attendance that student reported, and that's not going to be very accurate either. And then they don't do any demographies. So I can claim that they haven't done all this kind of stuff, whereas what I'm doing is all this combined and I've got exact attendance, attendance records, or those kinds of things. They say, so the covariates need to be there. If they aren't there, you can still report the study, but you can criticize it in this way, gently. They didn't do this. They don't say it's bad. You know it's bad. They don't say it's bad. No, no, no. You see, in the paper, you will not refer to anything particular with R. You see, if you look, look at what I've written, for example, you might find in the methodology, I'll say that all data analysis is done using R. And then you reference R as well, right? That's all. Leave it at that. As you know, the, the point is that anybody who reads the stuff who understands statistics will follow your analysis, but they might not be able to repeat it. Somebody who is a statistician or a data analysis analyst, analyst will know what you talked about and hide in the thing that can repeat the analysis given your data. That's the whole point, right? So in this case, I'm expecting you to submit your R code as well, but generally, of course, you won't submit R code. If you explain the methodology and say it's in R, then in the, in the data context, anybody who knows stats can reproduce the thing. Any more? Sorry again. Like uh, I saw your like um, your paper, so you're sort of saying like um, what they find, but what is their shortage? Yes, that's right. Are that's you right. Us to do this? If you do find those kinds of things in, in the papers that you survey, yes, say what you know. This is what they've done, but they didn't do it this way or did that way. Uh, whatever the shortcomings are, you can point it out. Yes. But as I say, you'd point out uh, what you're trying to say in the in the end is why you your work is worth reading. Yeah. What you've done that's different, that's more comprehensive or better than what others have done. But at the same time, you're going to work out what others have done to show that this work has been done before they found this thing. And when you do yours, and you can say how this is different from them, them or what the common things are. For example, you might find that age is common, a common factor in these kinds of things. Uh, income, for example, those kinds of things you might find as a common factor. And you found the same in your study as well. There's not a lot, lot out there. But you know, going beyond uh, looking at plots of residuals, there's not much out there for these kinds of models. This isn't, it's not the same as normal models, right? It's not the same. That's right, yeah. yeah. Normal models are a lot more in there because, I mean, with the mo normal models, you can test for things like, even here you could if you wanted to, you can test for things like independence of data. Normal models have seen constant variance, which you can test for. Those are the two key ones. And that the model, if it is the correct model as well. But she, you could not very little to work on. Well, putting everything is too complicated because your model will probably struggle to fit. Uh, you could try it with step I See, I don't think this has actually actually got any missing data. It might work. You might want to reduce it down a little bit, but. Uh, the thing is, if you do it, you probably will find some spurious correlations in things that just are useless. So I look for the common kinds of things. One of the common things is if you've got something like sex in your uh, data, that you should use that with something else. For example, I'd use sex with income. Yeah, sex with age, for example, sex with race, those kinds of things. Race with income, the common thing to look for, right? You might also use, uh, when you've got other data, for example, sex with BMI is a common one as well. Those are the common things, but if I'm taking a look at, say, something like, uh, uh, well, you might try sex with the type of visit as well. That may be something that's related to it. But uh, I wouldn't complicate it too much. I wouldn't like look at, for example, income with type of visit. 
you know, you might find something there, but that's going to be hard to interpret. Why well, should income make a difference to the kind of visit? It may, and you might find something there, and you might be, think it's worth reporting. I'm not saying it's not there, but uh, yeah, but some of them are common things. But when you look at continuous ones, for example, you probably will find, if you try hard enough, you probably will find that income and the race are related. That wouldn't be too unusual to find. Uh, income and age may be related as well. But you see, the more you try and the more you have continuous variables involved in it, the more difficult it becomes to interpret the thing and make sense of it. You want something that's nice and easy to interpret for you. Having said that, you, would, you shouldn't miss the more common uh, expected ones. You know, when I mark this thing, I'm not going to sit and say, look, I found, you know, five sets of introductions, you found only three. I'm not going to mark it like that. I'll mark it on the basis of, have you done something reasonable there? and not ignored total common kinds of things that you expect to find, right? So I expect that out of 170 students, I might find altogether they have 170 models, they're different. It doesn't matter. It's what you've done there, and it's reasonable good work, and you've actually managed to write this out properly, right? Because at this stage, I'm not expecting you to be, you know, professional statisticians to be able to judge where I should go, how should I figure these kinds of things out. Yeah, at the moment, just learning the stuff. So I'm not going to be that harsh marking it. I want you to just make a reasonable effort with analysis, not miss the expected common you know, things, and to write it up properly. And now I'm not going to expect to be out that there's going to be something you can publish straight away, yeah, a secondary level that's unusual. But I expect it to be written well enough to be understood, clear, yeah. Don't use complicated languages. Don't use too long sentences. You find, you know, you know even look, looking at things like on a student's uh, thesis, they got a sentence that goes through the whole paragraph. Don't. Cut it out. Make it shorter. Make it, you know, point by point. Writing is a skill that you have to learn along the way. Writing is something you'll do all your life as well, right? Writing is very important. And I repeat what I said earlier, as important as it is to make sure you're understood, it's also important that you're not misunderstood. Just changing words around, putting words in the right places, you know, things like each and only are, are good words to use, but they must be in the right places as well, you know? So be careful how you do that. Uh, you can try if you, but you see, square age is hard to interpret, yeah? I wouldn't try too hard with those kind of stuff. I wouldn't try too hard. See, square age, you might find in some things, it's not so much in people, it's probably more in things like plants or whatever, as if I think we do square age in some apple data, something like that, right? That's more common there because uh, um, things are different with that. I mean, you're looking at something like, for example, the uh, age of a tree, then you certainly will be using things like girth or whatever, just radius, radius squared, for example, is a volume kind of idea. But I wouldn't bother too much with humans. You might try that, and you might find it might improve the model. But you might find the curvature is also small. But uh, the thing with square is opposed to log is square tends to keep going up or keep going down, whereas log flattens off, and that's a more realistic expectation. Anything else? This whole class we just uh, just ran through the bar. So basically, we will have one, like for example, OF two as the reference variable. So we we were just able to know like how does other type of reasons compare to OF two. That's right. That's right. Now, as I said earlier, if you actually look at standard errors, you can probably compare some other ones as well. So essentially, standard errors can't be added up right because it's not those that you add up. You add up variances. And variances also have to be uh, appropriately uh, scaled by the number in each of those levels. But as a rough thing, for example, if one of the uh, coefficients is 2 and the other is 0.5, the difference is 1.5, yeah? And the standard errors are 0 0.01 each. Then the difference is too large compared to the sum of standard errors. So I can say these two are also different. But the main focus is going to be you can choose a reference level. You can re-level the data to set a reference level. That makes sense to you. I mean, those references are usually the base level of things. You can choose one if you want. And you can compare the data with it. Or you can leave it as it is and then report the thing as you see it, which is the ones that are highest compared to those that are lowest. So 
it's, it's set by alphabetical order. Yeah. yeah, so it'll set by alpha, whatever it is. But you can set one if you choose one. If you think this is my base level, I'll look at that. You can do that. I mean, usually if I look at data that, for example, you're looking at income and gender, sex, for example, males, females, then it's better to uh, set one somewhere if you choose it appropriately so that you can compare, especially with other variables as well. So, for example, you might find, I'm looking at uh, what things increases income. You might find actually males earn more than females. So I might want to make females the reference and not males, right? Also, of course, FM will be in the order with F and M, but just in case it's not the other way around. Or you might be, you're going to change the order and say, well, these things actually look at how income is decreased and make males the reference to see how females differ from males. The choice, this thing to some extent. In this case, I don't think it really makes a whole, different, whole lot of difference. In some cases, for example, if you look at, say, low, medium, high, yeah? and then you're going to get the order by alphabetical order is HLM. That's an odd way of doing things, right? Because you compare low and medium to, he to high. I'd rather go the other way, compare medium and high to low. Have a, an order there, right? So that would be a better way, way of doing it. But it's a choice in many ways. Sometimes in this case it's a choice. You can choose one level or you can just leave it as it is. Yeah. Well, really, the interest is interest really is in how the type of visits, the number of the type of visits depends. Yeah, it is uh, how they compare, right? But uh, uh, what you're doing is you're adjusting for that by looking at the other variables as well. So in the end, the emphasis is how the number of the types of visits changes, how they compare, right? And so, I mean, people keep confused about this and say, what is response variables? Do I use both type and uh, count? Well, you can't do that because they're different types of things. It's not a vector model in the first place. But yes, uh, you're looking at primarily, of course, the response is the visits, number of visits. Yes, yeah? count, twice on whatever else. And then you'll be like looking to see how the number of visits depends on the type of visits. What you're adjusting for everything else as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, your main focus is to work out how the number of visits depends on count, uh, uh, depends on type. But you can adjust for everything else as well to work it out from there. And Medicaid and insurance. Yep. What would you say? So you've got a ref reference level somewhere, right? Are you saying that a hospital isn't different from a reference level, but the others are higher or lower? Yeah. So you'll see what I've written there. Compared to this, these ones are higher. This one is lower. Done. Yeah? Don't go too hard into that. In the results section, you can quantify as well. In the discussion, you're going to just look at broad things. You might refer to the quantification in some way in discussion sometimes, especially when the differences are large, but otherwise your results will tell you, you, know, you know, how that works out. Yes, you can compare, you know, this is, for example, if you find that uh, uh, low income people don't go to hospitals so often or whatever, you can say this is similar to what others, this, not, you know, to what this person found or that person found or whatever, or similar to others found, and you can give a whole string of citations if you want, two or three of them. <laughs> what did you say, 500 words, yeah? And that's quite a bit of, quite a few words, actually. The abstract needs to be pointed, yeah? This paper or this study is on bank, yeah? And then you can explain what, that, uh, what you're doing here, uh, what the data source is, and uh, what you're going to, you know, try and work out there. If you don't make 500 words, it's fine, but 500 is quite a few words, actually. 
uh, you know, these days when you submit a PhD thesis, one of my students just did, they're required to give an abstract or a little uh, description of your PhD thesis. They spend three or four years doing in a hundred words. And you can do it. It needs a lot of focus because you've got to do justice to your work as well. But you can't use too many words. And this is, of course, the citation you get when you receive your PhD. Yeah? The graduation ceremony, they read this out for you for 100 words. You can imagine if everyone wrote 500 words and you've got something like 20 PhDs, it'll take you two hours, right? So 100 words is all you're required to do. It was 150, I think, earlier. Now it's 100. And that's actually plenty to describe your work. It's actually quite a few words. So you must focus on that. It doesn't make, 500 doesn't matter, right? You write what you think is important. 500 is the upper limit. You don't need to make 500. But if you just give me, you know, 50 words, I'll be rather disappointed. <laughs> the other thing I didn't mention is uh, you'll probably find most papers have this idea of keywords. I didn't ask for keywords. It's a choice. If you give me some, that's fine. If you don't give me some, I'll be bothered. Because what I put out there is the sections that I wanted to see or similar sections to that. But uh, if you can find some keywords, especially from past literature or whatever else, put some in if you wish. Make it sort of complete in that sense. Did I ask for any maths in there? Did I ask for any maths in there? All you're going to do is describe the methodology, meaning what models are you going to fit. Yeah, and what's the, essentially you'll have this uh, gradation of models, if you like, progression of models. And you'll explain why you're doing these things, methodology. That's really all. Yeah, quasi person doesn't allow this version test, neither does negative biodynamical. That's right. So if your Poisson is over dispersed, the quasi Poisson allows for that and gives it the dispersion parameter. That's okay because this, this is the whole point of quasi Poisson, yeah, to allow for that. Well, that if it's not over dispersed, you wouldn't you wouldn't actually use quasi Poisson. You use Poisson instead, yeah. So it doesn't really matter. No, you can't you can't do anything more with that. But it's a matter of now choosing is negative animal better or quasi Poisson better. So what is sort of the advantage Well, the Poisson model assumes the variance will be the same as the mean, right? Yeah. And if it's not the case, if the variance is much larger than the mean as the mean increases, then it's just not going to work. The model is unsuitable. Is there any difference when quasi Poisson is a biomedical or negative biomedical dispersion parameter is a quadratic function? Negative animal has more flexibility in how it adjusts for things. It's got two parameters to look at, yeah? Quasi yeah. Poisson still has just that to mean. Yes, yeah, so right, exactly. So it, it, negative animal is better uh, at handling odd data, essentially. But uh, uh, you should try both of those models. Quasi Poisson is simpler. It is Poisson, much simpler. So the base model is Poisson, but then you'd go to the other two if it didn't fit. Why, why would you do that? You see, not here to work out whether the, uh, you know, the issues with anything with the negative biodynamic, well, you can fit the model there and it's really all. Uh, I'm not asking you to look into the details of how that can be further adjusted, yeah? In, 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 some, some, in some situations, you can actually fix some parameters for some models. You don't gonna bother here. You're just gonna analyze the whole thing and see what works, what's good, what you can write out from there. Very quietness, what's going on? You're very quiet, just listening, are you? Any more questions? Well, I just said quite a few here earlier. 
uh, in your case, you don't have that many categories. You know, certainly, you'll take a look at things like income and race is a common thing to look at, right? The problem is, you know that income is related to race, but is it related to hospital visits as well? That's the problem. And you might find, if you find the introduction there significant, how would you interpret that? That's the main thing. There's no point building a huge model and then not making any sense of it. So be careful what you put in there and how you can make sense of it. Yes, having said that, of course, sometimes things don't make sense. What I'm saying is that you can interpret the thing, but it still might make sense. In that case, it's more difficult to work out what's going on there. And you can leave the thing out there saying, oh, well, this introduction term here doesn't make sense and leave it at that. We don't know what it actually means. That's fine, but I wouldn't do this in this case. I think you can make sense of more things you see in there. Should be okay, I think. So, you, I mean, if you tried no introduction terms, that'll be not very good. If you tried everything, that'll not, not be good either. You try a few here and there, the common things that you expect to see, and then see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, look, this, this is at six in the type of visit, for example, sex and uh, gen, uh, in the uh, income, age and in, age, sorry, age and the type of visit as well, income and sex, in, income and uh, race, those kinds of things you look at. How common ones do you expect to see something happening there? But remember, the whole thing is uh, the effect on the number of visits in the end. Anything else? Yeah. When you have interaction terms, you would not discuss main effects. I've said that before as well, right? You wouldn't expect any main effects. If you're trying to estimate the effect of a particular variable, then you have to look at the whole lot as a model equation, work out what the effect of each of those uh, terms is. But if you're looking at just the model itself overall, and the effects of uh, interaction term, I'd inter interpret just that. That, for example, you'd say that uh, uh, for, uh, for example, if you look at, say, sex and uh, the type of visits, so females, you know, have uh, more of these types of, vis of visits. That's one way to interpret that, yeah? All done, yeah. What does it mean if you're part of positive or this kind of topic has You might find some curvature there, but you wouldn't expect it to be very wild. The thing is, with this, this discrete kind of models, you, binary, for example, you would have probably quite often you have, if you do the rural city walls, you'll get straight lines. It doesn't make any sense. That's what you get, because the fitted value will be somewhere between zero and one, but the actual observed value is either zero or one. Right, so that's why you get the straight lines, depending on how the difference between one and zero is versus your actually observed, actually estimated proportion here. So you'll get straight lines there. It's possible you get sometimes not exactly what you expect for a normal normal uh, regression model. You get some lines and streaks. I think you might you might find that in my report as well. Well, as long as it's not too wild, you wouldn't bother with it. To make it more symmetric. Yeah, it's just to make it more, more log shift, meaning they log the data or they. Yeah, why would we do that? We'll move data from where? Well, if you log data that's got zero in there, it doesn't work, right? So the shift is just to make sure you don't take log of zero. That's all it is. There's also a model here of the equations of packets with a link back on it. So, so we virtualize in new state, like theta exponent, say theta exponent, so it weighs point to log on like uh, this one. No, you can look at the row as it is, and look at what's going on with the variables themselves. It's a log, log uh, model fitting for the counts in the first place, yes. But you would not necessarily look at the log of that. Uh, 
Well, you might put residual plots for all three, oh, compare them. The one thing you put in saying, look, okay, the plots for Poisson and uh, quasi Poisson and the negative binomial, see what they look like. You can compare those. I'll let you see something unusual. unusual. Uh, you see, the thing is, any figures and tables you put into reports should be discussed. Otherwise, there's no point for them, right? And you'll only put in those that have something particular to show. So if there's something you can't describe in words clearly enough, saying a plot of this and this showed. For example, if I'm looking at data and I look at a plot of, say, age, I'd say a plot of age showed right skewiness. That's good enough. I don't have to put the plot there as well because what I've just said is just a line and a plot will take a quarter page or something, yeah? So unless there's something particular I want to show and discuss, I wouldn't bother. I'll describe it in words if I can. Now I expect the plot will be in the appendix somewhere I can check up if I wish. But uh, I wouldn't uh, put a lot of plots and things unless they showed something specific. You can have something that someone else, you can put in tables of uh, Coefficients and p-values for the um, out for the you know model outputs if you wish, including significant variables only. You can do that. You can do that for each of Poisson and uh, quasi Poisson and negative binomial for comparison. But then you discuss the differences between the models, right? And so you won't be just a table there to show here they are and they're different. That's not good enough. Discuss where the differences actually are, right? What do you mean plot, one plot? Model. Well, the thing is, uh, you'll fit all three models fully before, before deciding which is the best. You certainly decide that the Poisson isn't going to work because of the problem of dispersion, but then quasi and negative binomial, you'll put all those three and then decide, well, Poisson is no good, but which of this is better. Yeah? You might find there's no difference. You can say, well, these are equally good. And you might also say that they might give you the same kind of results. Or you might find that one is a little better than the other one. Yeah? This was the likelihood kind of test and those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, like I've said this before on uh, email and other places. You, can, you need to do nothing more than just use the usual p-value approach here. That will be good enough. Yep, that will be just as good. Wolf's test essentially is what we call them, yes. See, as I was saying earlier, likelihood ratio tests are more to compare models. Um, so you look at different, two different nested models, essentially. You can't compare negative binomial with Poisson because they're two different kinds of models there altogether, right? But if you've got nested models where you've got a model with three variables and three coefficients and one with two coefficients, they're nested, right? So you can compare them, but you can also do the same with p-values. But when you've got some more different things like, for example, you know, when you look at more complex kinds of models, so you don't have this idea of p-values at all. You don't have that at all in some models. All you've got is nothing more than just the likelihood ratios or, or likelihoods to compare them by. Then you've got no choice. No. What does quasi mean? What does quasi mean? Look it up. What does quasi mean? Look it up. Search, search, Google. Yes, almost, essentially. Not quite there. Halfway, yeah? Because Poisson is some adjustment. The other term you'll find quite often is this out of pseudo. So it's a likelihood and pseudo likelihood. So likelihood sometimes is hard to, to compute, or you don't want to compute the whole likelihood, but you will compute something that's almost a likelihood, ignoring some other bits and pieces. And that's often another term you'll find quite often. So it's not quite Poisson. It's similar to Poisson, but some things are adjusted for. In other words, of course, Poisson expects the mean and variance to be the same. This one doesn't. 
sorry, mean and values to be uh, related here. Yeah. So whenever we observe all the distance of our function, it will take a bond. A negative binomial. Um, could it be, yeah, so I thought the combination seven to two is an abstract for the four squares to five to one squares to two to two to four squares. Uh, markdown is going spiral over the hat to the two to two to two to two. I got markdown for the hat to the negative two to one. And if the, like, what, like, what's the, what's See, the if you look at my reports, the only place I actually put a figure was when we were looking at the O rings for the shuttle, right? Yeah. Thing. Because there it was important to see how the uh, difference was in the failure probability. And we had the bands on there as well. That's the only figure I ever put in there. Everything else I was able to describe in words. If you do put figures, they must be fairly important and worth discussing in some detail. And some things you can't describe in words. I mean, if I'm, doing a, if I'm doing some model where I want to explain how the fit works, I can say, well, here's a fit of the data with the model, and you can see it's a very good fit, except in these places here. So it's quite often you can't just have things in words, and in, the case, in that case, it's worth a figure, but it's something you have to select very carefully. Because, you know, general articles in particular are very space uh, jealous with uh, how much they allocate you. So if you can do without figures, do it, do so. Table's the same thing. Any more questions? In other words, you do the modeling as you would for any other situation. You'd, you actually put the model, reduce the thing down, look at diagnostics for each of those. Yeah, if we can decide whether the person actually is no good and then uh, what the other ones look like. I know that take home exams and open book exams are much harder, right? But in this situation, I think even about three weeks or so, it's not meant to be that onerous. Yeah? Unless you do a very, very short job, I don't expect anyone to fail the exam. Yeah? It's a fairly straightforward assignment in one sense. Because you've got data to analyze, you analyze the data with three models, and just write that thing up. If you write it, I'm not expecting you to write at the level of, you know, a professor. But something at second year level. You write the thing clearly enough and with a coherent story to tell, it'll be okay. Yeah? In my opinion, it shouldn't take any more time than studying for an exam. When I say that, I would, uh, well, I mean, I would take that a good student <laughs> should study for an exam over a full week. So I expect it will take a week's work. So, yeah. And the good thing is it's finished before your exam really starts, so you can devote all your time to the exams, and there's one less thing to worry about in one sense. So I would just you know, do the whole thing and pump it out this week if you can. You've had last week was nothing much to do. Uh, the previous assignments due a week earlier. So between last week and this week, all the discussions and talk to everything, and just get in there and kill this one. Move on from there. Oh, good. Yes, it's still okay, possible to some extent. Well, if you've got both equally good, yeah, I'll go for quasi, but I don't think you have to make the distinction or make the choice. You can say they're both good and leave it at that. Yeah? Is the data the same for that lab test and this test? Hassan. Well, as I was saying, you don't have to choose between them. Certainly, you'll choose between the person and the other two, 
but the other two are, because Poisson would be clearly no good, right, if he's over dispersed. But the other two you don't have to choose between, unless one's better. They're both equally good, you say they're both equally good. Now, I did say you can choose a simpler model, but you see, between negative Barnabas and, and the quasi Poisson, there's not much in them of simpler. It's not like you've got 10 variables in one and two in the other one, right? It's not like that. It doesn't take much more to fit one than the other one, right? It's not much more complicated model, and they interpret it in the same way. Uh, you can say, well, they, you know, you can say they're both good and not choose between them, or they're both similar. But as I say, if you find differences between them, you can discuss the differences. Even though, though both models are good, or equally good, you can discuss the differences if there are any. No differences say so, there aren't any differences. Yeah? All good? No? Last question, you hear that, right? Ha! Somebody emailed me about that, and I didn't respond. Well, what do you think? No, I did, I did respond. I said, try it both ways. This was the number of chronic disease, chronic uh, ailments they have, right? It's one to eight, which is, uh, you might think that's a fairly large range in spread. But the thing is, if you look at a table of those things, you'll find how the counts are quite different. And the other thing is that, uh, if it was anything more than eight, then there's two choices here. And if the large counts, you can actually leave the thing as continuous and treat the thing as continuous. Or you can make it into smaller categories. So you could make it zero to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Instead of eight, you can make it four categories or three categories, right? But you can look at the counts to guide you as to how you break it up. The problem with breaking them up further is that sometimes the model will be sensitive to, to how you break it up, right? So we need some care there. But in this case, eight wasn't too bad, and there were, I have enough data to be able to do that kind of stuff. And uh, there were some differences between those, so I was able to keep them to all eight. So uh, you can try both of those if you wish and see how the differences are. I think you will find some differences. And in many situations, if you don't treat uh, one, of, one of the discrete kind of variables as a factor, you'll get totally rubbish results. I didn't say that. I said try it both ways. But you can see what I did and why I did it. Anybody else? Well, it has been an interesting semester, that's for sure. At least for me, I hope the same for you. I hope you've learned something about data analysis because my whole point was here and I, I keep saying this, if you come and do a course on data analysis, by the end of that, you should be able to, I should be able to give you any data to analyze along those paradigms that we've discussed and say, here's some data, analyze it. What do you get from there? You should be able to do that. If you can't do that, you haven't learned the material. Now, I'm not saying that makes you an expert. <coughs> Certainly, <coughs> it takes quite a bit to learn this stuff, stuff and get confidence with it. But you've made, I think, the first few moves into this. And, while I can test a thing easily by looking at, you know, small basic uh, questions or whatever else. And give, give you very nice, clean textbook data, it doesn't prepare you for real life. What's the point of getting this, getting this kind of stuff, right? I mean, if I want you to, uh, you know, go out there and... Uh, fight for the world championship in boxing, and you only have training against me, that's not good, right? Unless you hit a few times, you won't be able to survive there. So if, you're, if I want you to go face out some particular, <coughs> you know, some particular thing in your life, you must be prepared for it, you must be trained for it properly. And that's my focus over here. I remember there's what was watching this, the, the, the movie based on what was it called? The movie on chess, uh, and this uh, child has been trained by this trainer, and the parents are distraught because the child sometimes loses and feels bad and all the rest of it. And the trainer's point is that if you want a child to succeed, then you must prepare him for failure as well, and how you handle the failure. And also, you must make sure that you prepare him for success, both. 
So likewise here, you see, I think my point was not to give you this kind of nice sanitized data that works perfectly. You know, you've got something like five or six variables, the usual common expected uh, interactions all work perfectly, everything is fine and nice. We don't learn that from there anything, right? This is the whole point of putting out there with the real data. You can see how real data looks like, what the problems with this are, and how to handle that. If you can do that, you get nice data, things are perfect, easy. But as I say, you don't get nice data very often in your in real life. So I hope you enjoyed the course. I hope you learned something from it. Of course, there's going to be some kind of review somewhere afterwards. Please, if you put in reviews, and I hope you will do it, give me good comments. Don't say a bad horse because it doesn't tell me anything, right? And my focus, as I keep saying, is, is a search of the truth is always self-improvement. And I learn so much from my own students often enough. In my earlier courses in first year, I usually have a little review about week four or so, because the reviews at the end of the semester are useful for the next semester. It ain't going to do you guys any good, right? My review at the week four or so helps improve the course for that semester for those group of students straight away. Now, we didn't have time to do that this time around, but never mind. I hope you'll give us good feedback so we can improve the course. Uh, my style of assessment is quite different. You will notice that. But as I say, I think there's a reason for that, and I hope you appreciate that. Otherwise, good luck. We might meet again. Never know. So, enjoy the rest of your stay here.